Welcome to Revere Asset Management's Your Money with Danny Stewart. The market will always overshoot to the downside and to the upside. And Don Vandenborg. Because it's not how much you make in the markets, it's how much of that you can keep. Do you have Olympic caliber stocks? How can you tell? And when volatility picks up significantly, should you make adjustments to your portfolio? Well, the team at Revere is going to discuss those in great detail in just a few minutes. But first, your retirement plans, are they lobbyist pet projects? Are they the lobbyist and politicians pet projects and you're the cattle? Well, we got a new bill, and the article's in the money bag. We got a new bill to expand 403B options. 403Bs are for gov- nonprofit and government, like teachers and governmental you know, people, not in the private sector. But they're expanding the 403B options for more products because pro- the Congress and the lobbyists think it's their money, not your money. I mean, why not just allow ETFs and individual stocks, you know, full brokerage. Some 401ks offer that. Your 401k can if your your uh, company will allow it. But for these public workers and nonprofits, the choices in the areas they're trying to fund, they're not for you. They're trying to open them up to CITs, which are known as collective investment trust. They're an insurance product. I'm going to oversimplify. They're kind of like a mere mutual fund, if you will. They can, they can be like a, uh, a separately managed account. They can be in equities or real estate or private debt, debt and real estate. Those are, that's going to be an underlying theme today, uh, so pay attention. But in any event, they're, they're, this is affectionately called the Retirement Fairness for Charities and Educational Institution Act. Uh, I think we should call it Bend Over and Grab Your Angles Bogus Act and let's screw our public employees. That's really what they're doing. Folks, th- these, are, these are not transparent. It's not easy to see what's in there. And these benefit the insurance companies, not the 403B recipients. So you may want to talk to your congressman so let, let just very quickly, uh, the 403B requirement plans are going to now allow collective investment trust. They, uh, um, why they mirror 401k plans in some important ways, there's a unique set of rules and it's hampered the savers' ability to meet their retirement goals. Among the differences uh, is the inability to offer 403B to offer CITs or insurance company separate accounts. Well, among the differences, well, 403, 401ks also offer mutual funds and ETFs if they want to. Why don't we talk about those? Why are we only talking about the CITs, the insurance products, right? Um, um, I've never heard a client say, boy, I wish I had more to stuff into that annuity or to that insurance product. Anyway, that, so, and then another mailbag Investors sue TIA, Kreft, and Morningstar over their pricey retirement plans. Now, folks, the TIA, Kreft got together with Morningstar. They saw a big decline in in their services a few years ago. So they worked out a deal with Morningstar, and it's their, where is it called? It's their software program that actually directed almost everybody, nearly always, into the TIA traditional annuity, which kind of locks you in, like when you try to roll it out, it takes nine years, it's hard to get out, It's like the Hotel California, and the TIA real estate account. So now they're doing the annuity, the fixed income, and the real estate account, and they're, 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 but they're directing people in there. They've got this software program that's supposed to be non-biased, but it's directing them to the two most profitable TIA products. So it's really not about you. It's about them. And here's the thing. It said um, they, uh, they, they violated their best interest when making the IRA recommendations. Folks, the best interest bar is a very low bar. That means it's just suitable for you. But then they talk about them uh, doing their, their uh, 
breaking their fiduciary uh, 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 their fiduciary trust, folks, they're not a fiduciary. They're not a fiduciary. All right. Now it says with mutual fund. Now here's the big point. This is the lawyer suing them, and he's right. He said with mutual funds and ETFs, like I was talking about, you own the underlying stocks and bonds. Here, you don't own anything. You own a contract, the annuity. You own a promissory note by the insurance company with no transparency. In any event, the whole point of both of those is that they are trying to control you and put you in the products that they want, that they need, that they're having a problem with liquidity. And remember, I've told you before, the areas I think that are going to be coming up that we really got to pay attention to is real estate, especially commercial real estate, and all of this debt, all the private debt that we took on. All right, one more, and then we're going to get right into it. Where is that? Oh, it is four types of financial bubbles, and this is in the mailbag. And basically, folks, there are four types. You got finance with equity or cash, your own money, you didn't borrow, you didn't leverage up, and then whether it's a productive asset or not. Well, if it's a productive asset, meaning it's generating cash flow, or it's going up in value, it's a productive asset. If you finance with equity and it crashes, goes underwater, you just lost your money. It didn't affect the overall economy. You didn't have contagion. If you had leverage and you borrowed, then it makes it a little bit worse, but not as bad because it's still productive. However, when you have an unproductive asset, if you finance again with equity or cash, it's not a big deal. You just lost your money. If you finance with leverage and it's unproductive, it's not producing anything, that's when you get contagion throughout the financial system. That's what happened in 2008. Okay? Remember, in 2008, they had these pools and they took all these subprime, these bad mortgages and put them in and commingled them with the good mortgages. So they try to get the whole pool as double A or triple A rated to put lipstick on the bad debt pig. The problem is it really, so the whole pool really wasn't double A or triple A. And then when these non-performing loans started having trouble, it contaminated the whole pool. And then you had contagion and it set, it spread from real estate to everything else. In any event, the main thing is folks, it's always about liquidity. It's not the inverted yield curve. It's not this. Recessions and especially market crashes, market, not recession, but market crashes, stock market crashes are caused by liquidity crisis. So that's what you need to uh, follow. Ergo, and I'm trying to wrap these couple of topics together, I'm probably doing a poor job, but the problem is Wall Street, the sell side, is trying to direct you into things that are not, that are opaque, that are not, that are illiquid and non-transparent and that lock you in. And here at Revere, because it's your money, not their money, we're trying to keep you into liquid assets that you can get in and out of at, at your pleasure, at your leisure. Leisure. Leisure or leisure, Don? All right. Yes. <laughs> so, so the whole point is, if you can, Stay in liquid stuff. And by the way, folks, if you've got a, a 403B, let's talk about this right now. There's only two things that this bill doesn't pay. There's two things you can have, a mutual fund and annuity. And the annuity salesmen always go out to the teacher's thing, the, the luncheon, and they talk about how great annuities are inside the 403B. Folks, an annuity is tax deferred and it's bulletproof from creditors, except the IRS. 403B is already bulletproof from creditors and tax deferred. You don't need to pay 2% for the wrapper to go buy the Janus Growth Fund or the Fidelity uh, Contra Fund. Fidelity is probably already an approved vendor in your 403B. So you could go directly to the Fidelity Contra Fund and avoid the 2% annuity to the Fidelity Contra Fund. So if you've got a 403B, do the mutual funds. Do not do the annuities. In any event, you can, you can call me about that if you've got any questions. Those are both really important because as, as if things start to slow, if we start getting, because the economy is slowing, if we do actually start getting a re recession, you're going to start seeing areas in the economy that are having trouble. 
those are the areas that you need to avoid because it's about managing your risk. However, all the market forces are going to be trying to push you in those areas because those are the types of those are the areas that they're trying to plug the holes in. It's like the finger in the dam. They're trying to put your finger, your money, into the dam. Rather than that, why don't you give them the finger instead? All right. Oh. oh, was that a little bit inappropriate? Sorry, be a little bombastic. No, that was fine. <laughs> but, 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 but seriously, folks, pay attention and get your advice from a fiduciary like Revere, right? We don't have an axe to grind. We don't sell pro. Well, I do term life insurance and that's it, right? Term life because you, it's, to, it's, to, it's to insure a risk. It's not an investment vehicle. Don't let anybody, in fact, it's a violation to try to sell you an insurance product, an insurance, not an annuity, an in life insurance, even if it's a permanent with cash value, it's, it's against the regulations to sell it to you as an investment. The first question is, do you need the insurance at all? Anyway, I digress. So let's get into it. Now I've got a mailbag that I, I have responded to a guy. I reached back out to him. He's a prospect. He was looking, coming on board. He, likes Revere and he's followed our stuff. And I actually had him in the mailbag a couple, about a month and a half ago, two months ago when, when NVIDIA was just rocking. And we were talking about NVIDIA as one of our biggest positions. And he reached out and said, hey, uh, what do you think, man? I, I think well, I ought to go on to margin and take a 20, 30%, I'm paraphrasing, take a 20, 30% position in NVIDIA. I mean, if it's such a good stock, let's go, you know, let's go big. Why wouldn't you do it? And I said, well, 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 wait a minute. Right now, NVIDIA is very extended. It's not that we don't love the stock. It's just that right now at this valuation, I would be a seller versus a buyer if I had to do one or the other. But right now, we're in profit mode, and we're watching it. We're, you no, know, it's not a good idea. And it's especially not a good idea to go way too big and go on margin. So he was all FOMO, fear of missing out. He was worried about, you know, he, he already had some NVIDIA, had some good gains, and now... He wants more. People performance chase. This is behavioral finance. And that's what the point of this is. So then the market has sold off. For, not horrible. It's still single day. The S&P is not down that much. Donald tell you it's down six or five or something year to date. I mean, not down. I'm sorry. The pullback has been down 6% or so, right? Maybe seven. The NASDAQ, however, did breach the double digit. Now, some of these stocks, like NVIDIA, see, leading stocks lead not only on the way up, they lead on the way down. NVIDIA is off 35% last time I checked from the t around that from the top. Probably come back a little bit. Point being is, because of FOMO, this guy would have top-ticked the market. This guy would have bought the top. So I kind of told him, look, we'll get it. Let's wait for a pullback. We can get it later. Okay. Well, now the market's pulled back, so now he's scared. He wants to cover up. He doesn't, he's nervous. He's got money he wants to bring, but he doesn't, he's scared about putting it to work. I get that. I absolutely get that. All right. So this was my uh, 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 email to him. He's reaching out to him. Um, CW, you likely have an unbelievable opportunity once this market washes out. If you, he has a 401k that he was going to put into full brokerage. Uh, if you moved your 401k into cash, you should see, be sitting perfectly in cash at the ready, but you need a disciplined way to approach your investing based upon probabilities, <clears throat> not the two emotional cousins, fear and greed. If you listen to those voices, they will guide you into losing money virtually every time. I know this because I hear those exact same voices in my head, which is why I need rules rather than predicting, forecasting, or worse watching the news or listening to CNBC. I just had it that way. Fear and greed are actually good contra indicators. In other words, if you, you'll be better off listening to the opposite of what your brain's telling you normally if you don't have any rules than, than following your gut. That's counterintuitive. Usually your gut is pretty good with people and, and things, you know, but, but with investing, normally following your gut can, can get you in big trouble. Remember, just over a month ago, you wanted to leverage up on margin and take a huge bet on NVIDIA. I talked you down because while NVIDIA, because NVIDIA, while our favorite stock at the time, was quite extended. 
We were on profit watch. When you wanted to buy, it was at the top, and it has since fallen 35%. Now you're scared because the markets have fallen fairly hard, but this is counterintuitive. You actually want to be ready to enter quickly when, not if, the markets begin to act right. Of course, you should already have your pre-designated stop losses, um, so you know your downside risk if it goes against the probabilities. In other words, if you take a position, you know in advance what your ma- your loss is, 3%, 5%, 6%, whatever, and you know your downside. Before you buy, you always need to know where, it, where, where your stop is. Okay? Um, you can take comfort in knowing that you're, you have an exit strategy before you buy because when it is time to buy, it will not feel right and you will be scared. I always say, if you're not scared, you do, don't understand the deal. Folks, I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. Investing is very hard and it's difficult. It's not, sometimes it's easy, but a lot of times it's very difficult and scary. That's, again, that's why you have to have rules. Now, markets are still weak after attempting to rally today. This was a day and a half ago. But the washout, if it happens, will occur quickly. That is the time to buy NVIDIA if it is acting right at that time. In other words, is is NVIDIA the best place for your money or there are eight other stocks that are better? If it will be the best use for your and my money. You see, we invest right along the clients with the same portfolio. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, a correction in the markets is an opportunity. I'm sorry. On the other side of a correction in the markets is opportunity. On the other side of a bear market is a huge opportunity. This assumes, of course, that you protected most of your principal on the, on the way down. In the case of NVIDIA, it is having a bear market right now, and if it is the leading stock on the recovery, it will be a great time to buy. I'm not trying to preach. I'm just trying to provide you some behavioral finance insight as well as insight on how Revere is and will handling these markets. I personally believe NVIDIA will continue to be a leader in the next cycle, doesn't matter what I think, but it will have to confirm this by earning its slot in the portfolio just like the Olympics and not because I simply like it. Do you have Olympic stocks? All stocks have to initially earn their slot and then continue to earn their slot and pay their way onto the Revere Grotection portfolio. Otherwise, they are gone because it is all about relative strength and the best use of your money going forward. Always. You will never hear me say, don't worry, the markets always come back or just stay the course. My first question when someone comes in is normally, why wasn't this sold earlier before you incurred a big loss? What was your advisor doing? I would be happy to move forward and learn more about your business. We're happy to speak with you and your wife. Uh, I'm sure you're both scared about the markets and this change. Frankly, you should be scared and nervous. Uh, I am. That's why I need rules to take the nerves out of investing, to take the nerves out of the investing equation so my two arch enemies, fear and greed, don't screw it all up. Hope this helps and thanks. So, folks, that was a little bit of behavioral finance. People's risk tolerance changes with the markets. When the market's going up, greed kicks in, everybody wants in. When the markets are crashing, everybody turns into a wimp and everybody wants out. I know. I, I, look, Revere clients, I'm scared, and did you make me money? No matter what anybody tells me, even my own wife, my own mom, I'm scared, and did you make me money? Or did you protect the majority of my money or big chunk of my money when the market had a crash? It's all about risk management. It's all, and it's not about products. And it's not about a big, big global diversified portfolio, especially right now. The U.S. is the place to be currently with an emphasis a little bit toward, with the emphasis toward large caps, although small caps might be finally earning their way and looking like they want to heat up. So with that, Don and team, Dan, how do you know you have Olympic stocks? How do you adjust when volatility picks up? 
and what is the plan at Revere? All good questions, Dan. I know. Uh, first thing about volatility, we um, it's one of the uh, metrics that we include in the tail of the tape every night, and that's the average true range of the S&P 500. In other words, how volatile from high to low on average is the S&P 500. Under a one from our historical analysis is on the bullish side. If you start ticking up above a one, that means volatility is picking up. Why is it picking up? Usually there's uh, a geopolitical event going on or there's uh, something going on with a, a big leader or a big industry uh, that dominates the markets and impacts it that way. And this time, uh, what we saw was some weakening. This is the S&P 500 we're looking at. Um, we always say, you know, grow protection, dual mandate, grow assets during uptrends, protect them during downtrends. Definition of a downtrend can vary for people, and that's why we include the trend gauge on every video. We track things across three time frames. You can be in an uptrend long term and medium term, but in a downtrend short term. Uh, what we've seen recently, this this prior pullback that we had in May just turned into a, a pullback on the shortest term trend. We had one undercut of the 21 day moving average. That's our uh, short term indicator. And then we made higher highs. Then in the beginning of July, we started pulling back uh, again, broke the 21 day moving average. Then we ha had uh, the FOMC last Wednesday and there was an ugly close on the day and basically the Fed decided not to raise interest rates now kind of indicated that it was likely that they would do it in September uh, but the market reacted with concern that the Fed is getting behind the curve and then we had a jobs report that was weak and that was the gap down that mean we went men mean we went from just a short term correction to a medium term correction. As long as we're above this black line, that's the 200 day moving average. That's our long term indicator. The market, as you have heard me say a thousand times, never gets into serious trouble unless we break below this level. So what happens as we break the short term trend, break, break the medium term trend, our stops will by natu naturally take us out of the positions that we have. And that's what happened. And then as we start to break below uh, the short-term and medium-term trend, we pull back on our uh, exposure to the S&P 500 or broad indexes. We were also in uh, small caps. We were also in the equal weighted S&P 500 in addition to the market cap weighted. So on that big negative reversal with the Fed, that acted like a change in character. We started lightening up. We had another gap down. We lightened up some more. Another gap down. We lightened up some more. But what we're always on the lookout for is, um, and volatility spiked big time up to over 1.5% on the S&P 500. And uh, that's just indication of what we're seeing in the individual names and on the price action. Uh, volatility is not your friend uh, in the market, especially the way we uh, invest. So uh, then you want to look, when does a bottom come into the market is the first thing that you want to look for. Monday morning, we had. Um, not only everybody digesting uh, the bad jobs report and what was going on with the Fed possibly being offside, but we had saber rattling by North Korea uh, and by Iran. And then we also factored in that Japan uh, is having issues controlling their currency, their bonds, and their stock market. Uh, something called the carry trade, where people have been borrowing money at 0%, investing it. Uh, with a lot of leverage in other markets and Japan indicated they were going to start raising interest rates. So there was like three or four things that all hit the market Monday morning and there was some panic selling. We reduced our exposure and then you start looking for things to normalize, to calm down for volatility to reduce and for support levels to hold. We actually put in the low within the first 15 minutes on Monday morning. And this pink line on here is the 150 day moving average or the 30 week moving average, uh, a big key level that Stan Weinstein uses uh, and we use as well. 
uh, looking at the NASDAQ 100, it actually undercut and reclaimed that long-term 200-day moving average, also putting in a low very early in the day. So what's transpired over the last uh, week is we constantly monitor for relative strength in leading names. And uh, I threw together a list of stocks that were holding up well, and there hasn't been a single one of those names that I had to take off the list over the last four days. In fact, the list is increasing. And as part of the segment, we're going to each do our Fab Four stocks. So we're going to end up by the end of this with 10 names and two uh, ETFs representing two sectors that have really been holding up and are setting up uh, as possible leadership candidates if the market uh, continues to go higher. So we're on day four off of the low of a rally attempt, Tuesday being day one because it's the first time we closed higher off of the lows. We had an ugly pullback on Wednesday, but those lows held and the 150-day moving average held on the S&P as well. Yesterday, we had an inside day that closed at the high. Today, we've had a very tight range day, and this is one of the key things that we want to look for is that volatility contraction. Today's uh, range is only uh, 40, uh, is, is 0.8 on the S&P 500. In other words, what it had been before this whole pullback started. Uh, so we're seeing a nice uh, consolidation day, and we're also seeing the market hold this 5,300 level, which is a breakout level back in June. We pulled back to it and held on that second day down, but we broke it on the third day down. It acted as resistance on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but we got back above it on Friday now. So these are all little green shoots, you could argue, that is that are indicating that the market is at least stabilizing, certainly with that uh, tight range that we're seeing today. And that's a very positive uh, thing. It could be, oh, this is as of 12, 10 Eastern time on Friday, it could be completely different by the end of uh, the day or the end of, uh, or uh, early next week. But then the next level that we look for is this, um, we're also uh, working our way back above the eight day exponential moving average. I don't have that short term trend uh, line on here too, but that's our ultra short indicator of trend. And we're working our way back above that on the S&P as well. And then the next thing that we look for is this 21-day moving average that is in a, a severe downtrend. It is below the 50-day moving average. And at some point, price will come up to meet that. And that's going to be a rubber meet the road type of situation. Uh, will we find resistance at that level and fail? How will the leading stocks that we've identified uh, start acting if we hit that level? And that's going to give us a lot of insight next week into whether or not we've put a bottom in. And then, of course, we need Japan to stay stable. We need Iran and Israel not to start World War III. Um, yeah. uh, and we need uh, no negative economic data. I do want to point out uh, Thursday morning we got uh, job openings that were lower than were expected. And that sparked a gap up in the market and it held that gap and it's following through to the upside as well. So uh, we're back to good news is good news for the market because we're trying to get over the fear of, inflation seems to be put on the back burner. Now we're really worried about, is it gonna be a soft landing or are we gonna uh, go into a recession? So market always fights a wall of worry, but I'm uh, me, the whole team really is gaining optimism based on the individual action of some lead, potential leading names that we're seeing as well as the stabilization of the indexes. So that's a very long answer to what's going on with the market, but I think it covered uh, both the upside and the downside for what we're looking for. And for the downside, you know, certainly we need to hold uh, the lows and the 150-day moving average or 30-week moving average on the S&P 500. Break below there puts the 200-day uh, in range. We are, how far are we above the 200-day moving average right now? Uh, we are... 5.7% uh, at the lows on Monday, we got as close as 2.5% uh, to it. So uh, things deteriorated quickly over three weeks. Now we're trying to stabilize in the market. August is a notoriously poor uh, seasonality, from a seasonality standpoint, a notoriously poor time for the market. And we're just taking it day by day. The market is winds are not at our back, so we cut exposure. As technicians, we can identify the difference between a healthy market and a risky market. 
and risk had picked up with the breaking of the moving averages and the increase in volatility. So now we're looking for normalization and leading stocks to make the decision for us, not our opinion, the market's going to tell us whether or not we need to uh, add to our positions or pull back. And we did yeah, buy decrease, our yeah, decrease uh, exposure. Yeah. So whether we want yeah, to and we did, exposure. Yeah. So one thing I want to and we did bring, go, ahead, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, so so nope, go ahead. So one one thing I, I want to bring up. So that was like drinking out of a fire hose and the stock nerds that the community that follows us religiously, they caught all that. I want to simplify it just for the retail investor that may not be as sophisticated that's watching for the first time. The one the really easy thing to realize that Don just said, the, he screens every morning for stocks, for fundamental increasing revenue growth, uh, income, all kinds of different things, screens for leading stocks. Just a few weeks ago, a week ago, when the market was really struggling, he was getting very few stocks, maybe even almost down to single digit. When the market starts doing well, all of a sudden 30 or 40 names will appear on his list. That means breath market breath, more stocks are participating, it's expanding, it's becoming more bullish, it's just not a handful of stocks. So even while emotionally you might be scared, hell I am, right? And you're nervous and I like mostly my brain is telling me I'm scared and I'm my uh, my thought, my emotional thought, my gut thinks that the next move is down, it's going to be a sell off, which could be right or wrong. But Based on Don's analysis, it looks like we're holding and probabilities are starting to increase and look better that we're going to hold this and it's we're, we're going to move higher. Now, if that changes, we always say also, it's okay to be wrong. It's not okay to stay wrong. So if this market starts going higher and we start getting in, get more exposure and it rolls over, we'll turn around and get right back out. That's what I was saying in that uh, mailbag letter, that, that note. That, that it's when you're scared, it's a lot better getting in knowing that you've got a quick exit, you've got a parachute. You know what your loss is going to be if probabilities don't work out. But if that same probability setup came again later, I would take that same setup. This is about probabilities. But the biggest, the easiest thing to understand that Don said there is the number of stocks on his watch list has just increased. So the market is becoming a little bit more bullish at this point. All right, go ahead, Don. One, one of the things that's different during hard pullbacks like this that we normally do when the market is in an uptrend also is we look to identify, we call them uh, titans, uh, big companies with rock solid balance sheets and growth prospects uh, that may have unfairly been uh, the baby thrown out with the bathwater over the last couple of weeks during the pullback. Uh, so we're all, we're always keep we're always keeping an eye on these um, these franchise type titans uh, to see if they stop going down. And every every stock bases at some point. A prime example of this is uh, Chipotle. We we don't own this. In fact, it's not in the twelve that we're uh, going to discuss. But they did a ten for one, a fifty for one stock split. I'm sorry, and it just really threw. Uh, turmoil into the ownership uh, of it. You can see this big down day right before and then a harsh sell-off after the split. But Chipotle is Chipotle. They haven't had an E. coli scare. Uh, they reported earnings and the earnings were not were well received, not uh, glare, glowingly received, but the market was in a correction. You always have to temper the reaction to an earnings report with the overall perspective of what's going on with the market. Uh, it had a big shakeout along with the market on Monday, uh, but Chipotle regained the 200-day moving average, and now it's crawling its way back up, and it's starting to form the right side of this base. has stellar fundamentals. It's uh, really one of the ultimate can slim stocks. Uh, it's just that it fell from 70 to below 50 uh, because of the market and because of the stock split. So uh, this is an example of the things that we look for. And then in addition, and, and I'm going to go through my fab four first, and then Ted and Connor are going to do theirs. And the first stock that we bought, uh, we bought it today, in fact, was Eli Lilly. They reported earnings uh, and the stock gapped up. But let's look at a five-minute chart here. Initially, it had a huge gap up, and then it sold off. And uh, 
the, the, the thought was, well, that's just typical of what's going on with the market now. Uh, it could completely uh, give it up. It had been in a downtrend. Again, this is another case of uh, the baby being thrown out with the bathwater. It dropped from almost a thousand dollars down uh, to seven, the seven hundreds. Uh, but uh, it had a big shakeout on Monday, and then it reported earnings. It had massive uh, earnings, eighty-six uh, percent earnings growth, thirty-six percent sales growth. It upped its uh, sales and earnings guidance for its weight loss drugs. Uh, and it stabilized on the pullback at the 21-day moving average. That's the green line here. Uh, this morning, it got a big upgrade, and the the volume today is as big as it was on the earnings day. Blasted above the 50-day moving average, blasted above the high of the earnings day, which made it a day two higher high. And this prompted us to, to take a position in this. So this is the first name that we bought. Obviously, it broke this uh, steep downtrend line with the gap up on earnings. Uh, but back above all the key moving averages, the 21-day moving average is hooking up higher. The volume is there. The price action is being supported. Uh, the relative strength line is close to a new high before price is. That's a very uh, key uh, flag that we look for uh, to, to put something in the plus column when we're identifying stocks. You always want to see the relative strength holding up its end of the bargain. But um, So this is the first name that we bought, and it's the first of the Fab Four. Uh, as far as stocks that are holding up that are on uh, the top of our watch list. The next three, this is another one that's a very strong company that has possibly unfairly, you know, we, we say uh, the, the technicals override everything. Um, the fundamentals are always best at the top, but Uber really got taken apart from 82 down to 55 uh, earlier this week. But they reported earnings. I read su some summaries of the earnings and they were just absolutely fantastic. Uh, the CEO is very um, pleased with the outlook for the company. Uh, analysts upgraded it. It's got 112% earnings growth in 2025 with a 76 PE. That makes it even with a 76 PE comparatively cheap, cheaper than stocks like Procter & Gamble when you're on a peg ratio basis. So this is on the list. And since that big uh, volume earnings day move up, uh, it's regained the 21, the 200, and the 50-day moving average. Uh, it's still below the 100-day moving average, but uh, the great reaction by a good company. Now we're just waiting for the technicals to line up with the fundamentals. So that's my second stock. The third one is uh, Palantir. This is another one that was just a big earnings winner uh, when they reported. Uh, Again, analysts tripping all over themselves with platitudes of um, joy on what Palantir did. Uh, it tried to move higher initially on Wednesday and pulled back to the 21, uh, but then it's had two days. This is this is key. The volume that was higher on the move out yesterday was above the volume on the second day pullback after earnings. This is very rare to see this. Normally, you see the volume declining as the as the days go by past an earnings report. And it finally did break out and now it's making a higher high today. 80% uh, 80, 80 earnings growth, 27% sales growth. Uh, it's expensive. It's got a 92 PE, but this is again, the typical can slim stock, extremely liquid for institutions uh, to get into. Uh, so we'd like to look at this one here uh, here as well. Palantir is my number three. And number four is, again, a great uh, great management by this company, Kava. Uh, Ted and Connor brought this to my attention, and we made some nice money in it back in April when it broke this uh, declining wedge on volume and had a huge run, went higher highs on earnings, then uh, started to base. Things don't go, go to the moon forever. I mean, it did run from 40 to 100. Uh, so it started to base while the market was going higher. And uh, then some signs of the consumer slowing down started to hit. Restaurants all took a hit. This one was included in that. Uh, they've got earnings in three weeks, but it put in a big spike on Monday. Uh, and you can see the volume the last two days on this getting back above the 21 and now today uh, back above the 50-day moving average. So this is another fundamentally sound stock with. Um, that's starting to form the right side of its base. It was possibly a baby out with the bathwater situation. That's how we're viewing it. 
Uh, but it's something we want to get into if the market starts uh, turning and a bullish uh, phase in the market kicks in again. Uh, so it's a combination of what's going on with the indexes as well as what's going on with these individual leaders that we're keeping our eye on. So those are my four. Any questions on any of those, Dan, before I turn it over to the fellas? No, I think that was very good. I, th I like that, Don. All right. So, Ted, you want to give us your fab four first? You've got three stocks and, a, and yep. an ETF. Of course. So if you're to take a look at Don's names, I'm going to just share some characteristics that I look for during corrections. And you'll definitely see them in my names. And I bet you'd see them in Connor's names as well. And so the moment we start thinking that we're heading to correction, we're getting signs that we are pulling back into a correction on the main indexes. They start to look for stocks um, first, making new 52 week highs while the indexes are making lower lows. Second, I also look for the relative strength line uh, to make new highs. It could be before price or coinciding with price. And if it confirms it with price, that's even stronger. I look for stocks that are basing that don't break the lows of their base and don't make lower highs and lower lows. And even better if they're making higher lows and higher highs while the markets are making lower lows and lower highs. And then in some of Don's names, you'll see um, stocks quickly finding support, seeing a huge uh, wide range candle to the upside, reclaiming uh, key moving averages um, that are higher than what the markets are reclaiming. For example, Palantir's, Palantir quickly reclaimed um, some short term moving averages. And right now the markets or the S&P is still below its shorter term and intermediate term moving averages. So those are some characteristics I look for. Um, so let's jump right into it. First one is Spotify. We'll take a look at that. Um, recently it gapped up on earnings into new 52 week highs, actually while the market was already starting to pull back. So when that happened, it, it went on my radar instantly um, just to watch. And its earnings were quite spectacular. It reported 184% year over year uh, earnings growth and then 18% on revenues. And essentially, Spotify is a duopoly between itself, Spotify, and Apple Music. But Spotify definitely has a significant edge because they do have exclusive deals with certain podcast creators that can only post their content on Spotify. And when you think about it, Apple is diversified and spread, spread out into so many different products and services, but Spotify is solely focused on, on their uh, music and podcast streaming. So just from that, they're concentrated. So all of their focus effort is on creating the best platform for listening to music and podcasts. And me as a user, I know they're extremely sticky business. What I mean by that is um, they have pricing power. So they, I think they've raised prices on me three times in the last year. Every time I got the email, didn't even think twice. I was definitely going to keep Spotify. Um, so that's just a, from a personal experience with Spotify. And then post earnings, they got 13 price target raises um, from all over the street. Goldman Sachs, Evercore, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley. It's so all the big bulge bracket banks, all, all are liking what they saw on Spotify. And then finally, they, they're seeing higher than expected quarter three um, guidance as well versus last year too. And so after earnings, um, actually on the FOMC day, we broke out to another new all-time high, but with the weight of the market, with the scares that Don talked about in his market analysis, it, it fell to the, to the pressure of the markets as well. But like I talked about, one of the characteristics I look for is for, for a stock to hold key levels and quickly reclaim moving averages and levels. And on that one day, um, when we had a quote unquote mini crash, Spotify found support at the 100 day and quickly reclaimed the 50, 21, and almost the 8. And that is with the markets closing below the 8, 21, and 50, and 100 day. So that's another telltale sign that this is stronger and is presenting a relative strength opportunity. The second one, I've mentioned this name multiple times on the podcast before TMDX. And just quickly going over what they do, they have this organ care system that's a lot more efficient and effective in transporting organs around the country from hospital, from source uh, to where they're supposed to be implemented into a patient. And this is clearly seeing huge demand. Um, they have huge earnings, 1,266% year over year on 67% surprise. 
into third quarter of earnings acceleration. And then on the sales side, I talked about this last gap too, um, 118% year over year on 16% surprise. And this is the 10th quarter in a row of triple digit sales. And additionally, they, they raised guidance as well um, from 360 to 370 million to 425 to 445 million um, on a 40 year basis. And this just shows that, I mean, it, it's backed up by the data as well. So many patients around the country are waiting for organs. Um, sometimes they'll receive organs and the organ has failed. And this, this will save a lot more humans um, in our country. And so heading on to the third one, it's another healthcare name. Um, I'm actually seeing that as a theme. A lot of biotech and healthcare names are holding up or gapping up on the earnings is ALNY. It first had that huge gap when it announced pos positive clinical trial data on one of their treatments for um, just a heart condition called transthyretin amyloidosis cardiomyopathy. You can forget that name, it's, it's a mouthful. But essentially, it reduced uh, the risk of death by 36%, and also reduced 33 reduction in just cardiovascular symptoms, uh, negative symptoms for the patients. And when that ran up, you could see those, those black dots as well. That is what we call ANTS indicator, and that was created by David Ryan, who got Market Smith to implement it in, in to pl implement the indicator into the chart. Um, I'm not going to go over the characteristics now, as we have in the past but it just shows that institutions are accumulating the stock. Under When the correction then started, um, it also fell prey to the weight of the market, but it, felt, it found support near that 21 EMA, and then on earnings, which it did really well on, gapped up into new 52-week highs, and so far it's forming a really tight pivot here, so definitely on high watch as well. And if you look at that RS line, it put in a lower high, I mean, not a lower high, a higher low, and then made higher highs with price. And that's another characteristic I was talking about when I listed um, the, the traits I want to see when I started my section. And then finally, um, a sector ETF, ITB, the home builders. This one also, when, when the S&P 500 and NASDAQ first started correcting, this actually went on to make higher highs and that got my attention. But again, once, once recessionary narrative started uh, seeping into the market, saw some weaker jobs data, um, that carrier trade started unwinding. This also fell uh, prey to the markets were pressured to the overall market, which is normal in leaders. That happens on the right side, but it's, it's ascertaining the magnitude of how much it pulls back or where it is relative to its moving average and its support levels uh, to the markets. And this one definitely has held up much stronger than the overall markets. You can even see that in the RS line as well. And then just a few individual, individual names in this sector. You can pull up like Lennar, L-E-N, um, D-H-I, afterwards Don, and then P-H-M. All these stocks are getting really tight on this right side here. And then fundamentally, um, if we do head into easing cycle, which it seems like we are, where Fed, the Fed cuts rates, traditionally home builders tend to do quite well as well. So this is, this is my fourth name or fourth fourth name as a sector, and then I highlighted a few stocks in that sector. Great job, Ted. Uh, much appreciated. Let's uh, turn it over to Connor now. He's got three names and a sector as well. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely agree with all the characteristics Ted mentioned. And one thing I just wanted to add is, you know, when the market gets in a correction or a pullback, that's like the best time to really do your homework because um, Corrections aren't necessarily a bad thing because it's going to tell you if your stock's good or not. And so you want to be on the radar for relative strength and, and what's holding up. So uh, my first name is Sweet Greens. This is ticker SG. And I bring this one up because it kind of ties into what Don was saying earlier. Kava's retaken the 50 day today. Chipotle is trying to find support. And Sweet Greens is a higher octane. Um, name in this food sector. It's gapping up 20, it's up around 22% on earnings today on huge volume. Um, and they're, you know, turning the corner of profitability, but uh, their, you know, their sales growth and their forecasts are really good. And this is a newer, younger name. Um, and yes, yeah, 
you, Don's pointed out the previous earnings reports and that's had great reactions. And the recent earnings report, it didn't have much follow through, but the one before that, it had a really nice trend. So that could be a trajectory that it follows on this uh, recent earnings gap. Um, and then the second name is SN. This is Shark Ninja. And this is another recent earnings gap. It gapped on highest volume ever out of this IPO base. And then it's putting a, a day two higher high today. And this is um, a super easy to understand name. I'm sure most people watching this have products in their home, but the price action doesn't lie. And this had a huge run up earlier this year. And then as the market was correcting, it started to base a bit and now it's getting, and now it's moving higher, had the highest volume ever. That clearly means institutions are piling in and relative strength line into new highs. So this is a clear leader and a bit extended now, but what to look for is, you know, if it can put in, we talk about those post earnings flags, a couple tight days, let the moving averages catch up. Um, could provide an opportunity if you didn't buy on the gap day and the numbers are good. Um, you know, 50% earnings growth um, and whatnot. So this is a good name to keep on your radar. Third name is ServiceNow. So two weeks ago, I talked about this name and we actually bought it. It had a fantastic earnings report. And this is, this name checks every canceling box, earnings, revenues, return on equity, um, something new, institutional ownership. This one is like a model book can some stock. And like we were saying, the market pressure pulled a lot of stocks in and this is kind of where you find the beach balls underwater. They might pull back in with the market, but you know, holding above key moving averages, that relative strength line is up to the right side. And um, now it's forming a flag just under, under this 815 pivot. So, um, you know, it bounced off the 50 day on market weakness, but now it's setting up a pretty clear downtrend line with those moving averages right below. And um, so, yeah, that's acting great. And if you look at the weekly, it's got a huge weekly base. And then sector wise XBI, I'm including this sector because this is one sector that we've been watching for a couple of weeks now. And this again came in with the market. Um, but one theme we're seeing is a lot of medical biotech names like Ted mentioned, the AL, ALNY, TMDX, REGN. There's a lot of them. Um, those are some of the best looking charts. So a way to play that if you don't want to pick an individual name is you can play it via XBI or LABU, which is the levered ETF that tracks XBI's performance. But, and if you pull up the weekly Don, this still really hasn't broken out and followed through yet out of this weekly base. So if this can finally get back above that 100 level with volume, that could finally see the move that we've been looking for in biotech. Great stuff, Connor. Yeah, biotech is really the ultimate risk on uh, sector. And the reason for that is that so many of them have no uh, revenues and there's a lot of speculation. The market really only rewards uh, names like that if you're in a strong bull market. So we're always keeping an eye uh, on the biotech sector. Dan, that's your uh, three times Fab Four or Dirty Dozen. And uh, we're done on the technical side. You can go ahead and take us home. Thank you, Don. And Don, I love the dual mandate. The dual mandate dual of protection. Mandate. I like that. Folks, if you want to learn more about the dual mandate of protection, uh, try to grow your portfolio when the probabilities are solid with the markets. But when we're in a downtrend, protect. You can just tell your friends and neighbors, just go up to Revere Asset in the upper right-hand corner of our website, revereasset.com. There's a subscribe button. Just tell them to put their name and email in there. We're not going to hassle them. It's up to them to reach out to us. By the way, there's a contact button right next to the subscribe button. They can, you can send me an email uh, to, uh, for a complimentary portfolio review, or if you want a stock or a topic discussed on the podcast, or you just simply have a question about Revere. Now, with that subscribe button, you'll get our daily market insight video 
uh, every night that the market is open. We go over all the index levels. We go over the stock. We go over stuff we're actually doing in the portfolio. We're the most transparent advisor that I'm aware of. And then um, um, you will also get this podcast in your inbox on Saturday morning. However, if you go to YouTube.com and just Google or just search for Revere Asset and hit subscribe, Zach will have this podcast out by about one Friday afternoon. You'll get it a couple hours for the close for the stock nerds. You can also email any of us, Dan at RevereAsset.com, Don at RevereAsset.com, Ted or Connor at RevereAsset.com. And you can always, always, always call us old school at 855-REAL-WEALTH. Folks, we'll talk to you next week on your money, not their money, your money. Because it's not how much you make in the markets, it's how much of that you can keep. <laughs>